In the words of the psalmist, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And while we can't join together physically, we're glad that you are joining with us through the World Wide Web as we come together for worship. This is a difficult time in our nation's history, but we're glad that you're joining us here today and encourage you to join us every day through our Facebook page as we continue to try and connect via Facebook. As we come together for worship, we'll begin with an opening passage of scripture. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a glorious heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. The Lord is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also dwells secure. For you do not give up, give me up to Sheol or let your godly ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Join me in a short prayer. Creator of the universe, you made the world in beauty and restore all things in glory through the victory of Jesus Christ. We pray that wherever your image is still disfigured by poverty, sickness, self selfishness, war, and greed, the new creation in Jesus Christ may appear in justice, love, and peace to the glory of your name. As we worship together this day, be present in our hearts and lives and be glorified through them as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen.
to go before the Lord with all our prayer concerns and all our, all our needs because we know that, that God supplies all our needs and, and certain prayer requests that we're, that we're aware of. Uh, we know that uh, Katrina Villacampa's uh, brother uh, had surgery this week and, and we just uh, want to be sure to, to lift him up and, and pray God's presence and healing in his life. And as you, uh, as you have your own needs, if you would like to, uh, to send those uh, via a Facebook message, you can make a comment below. 
whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can make comments, you can send emails, you can call us in the church office throughout the week and make those known. And we're, we're uh, pouring uh, over those prayer requests and, and praying for you throughout the week. And as we, uh, as we do so now, uh, remember to lift one another up in prayer this week. Uh, this is, continues to be a difficult time uh, physically for some. It's uh, emotionally for others. It's, it's a difficult time. And, and so just remember to lift your brothers and sisters in Christ up. And at this time, let's go before the Lord, our God, in prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, we want to build our lives on your love because we know that it's a firm foundation. Nothing can shake the love of God. And we're so incredibly grateful for that love this morning. God, you establish your love in our hearts and you do that for the purposes that your love would pour out of us for the sake of others. This is the ministry of reconciliation that you've given to each one of us. So this morning, we don't come before you on an island by ourselves, but we come before you together as your body, knowing that you love us and you love us for the sake of the whole world. So this morning, God, I pray that you would let us be lights in the darkness, that you would show us who you are, what your power is, that this world might be transformed in us and through us by the power of Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead, who defeated death and sickness, and pain so that we don't experience those things as a final word but we experience them in your resurrecting power that all things are made new we thank you God for making us new and we pray your presence in this world all the more help us to carry that presence into the world and live in your love. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Healer, the Redeemer. Amen. Seems like all I could see was the struggle of my failures Wondering how long is this gonna last Then you looked at me prisoner and said to me son stop fighting a fight that's already been won Take off. 
chains to wipe away every stain. Now I'm not who I used to be because I don't have to be the old man inside of me because this day is long dead and gone because I've got a new name, a new life. I'm not the same and hope that will carry me home I am redeemed you set me free so I shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain cause I'm not told an interviewer uh, that you have learned to, in your words, love the thing that I most wish had not happened. Um, I remember you went on. To, you went on to say, uh, what, what punishments of God are not gifts? Do you really believe that? Yes. It's a gift to exist. It's a gift to exist. And with existence comes suffering. There's no escaping that. And I guess I'm either a Catholic or a Buddhist when I say those <laughs> things, because I've heard those from, from uh. both traditions. But I didn't learn it that I was grateful for the thing I most wish hadn't happened, is that I realized it. Mm -hmm. Is that, and it's, a, it's an odd, oddly guilty feeling. It, you don't, it doesn't mean you I are don't happy. Want, I don't want it to have happened. I want it to not have happened. Right. But if you are grateful for your life, which I think is a positive thing to do, um, yeah. not everybody is, right. and not, I'm not always, mm -hmm. um, but it's the most positive thing to do, then you have to be grateful for all of it. You, it's, you can't pick mm -hmm. and choose what you're grateful for. And then, so what do you get from loss? You get awareness of other people's loss. Well, that's true. Empathy. Which allows you to connect with that other person. Right. Which allows you to love more deeply and to understand what it's like to be a human being, if it's true that all humans suffer. Right. And so, at a young age, I suffered something so that by the time I was in serious relationships in my life with friends or with my wife or with my children, is that I have some understanding that everybody is suffering. And however imperfectly acknowledge their suffering and to connect with them and to love them in a deep way that not only accepts that all of us suffer, but also then makes you grateful for the fact that you have suffered so that you can know that about other people. And that's, that's what I mean. It's, it's about the f fullness of your humanity. What's the point of being This interview came out about eight months ago. And, and the first time I watched this, a, a few things immediately struck me. First was the unmistakable tremble in, in Anderson Cooper's voice as he quotes Colbert's words and says, you also said, what punishments of God are not gifts? Do you really believe that? As though Cooper is genuinely, earnestly, desperately seeking the answer that Colbert gives, yes. The second thing that struck me was, was that as Colbert talked about grief, it was as if he was pulling out and explaining to me everything that I had been experiencing in the wake of my dad's death and hadn't been able to adequately explain myself. The idea that you can want so badly for something 
to not have happened, and yet to be so strangely grateful at the same time for it having happened, it's, it's a bit bewildering. It was two years ago yesterday that my father passed away after what seemed like a really short illness. And in reality, it was just a little over a year uh, when you take into account the initial discovery of his cancer. And throughout the days and weeks and months leading up to and following my dad's death, my brother and sister and I walked side by side in our grief. And as somewhat of an aside to the morning, this was another gift that was, that was given to us during this time. I mean, I've always loved my brother and sister, but something changed during this time for each of us and, and all of us at the same time. But following my dad's passing, as I, as I came back to Florida, I walked through grief and pain, and unsurprisingly, some of that pain still persists today. I mean, I can't hardly listen to, to Simple Man by Leonard Skinner or, or, or The Outlaw's Green Grass and High Tides without being whisked away to another time and place that, that doesn't fully exist anymore. And when I come back to reality, I remember my grief again, but, but as I was experiencing the most intense pain from this loss, there was a pretty immediate recognition that there was a strange grace to this grief. And this grace is that I was suddenly aware of what it truly meant for anyone to grieve. One of my brother's very dear friends passed away this last week after, after battling cancer. And now my brother is walking alongside his best friend, this friend's husband, as he grieves the loss of his wife. I mean, what a strange and difficult gift our grief can be. That now my brother has firsthand knowledge of suffering and can walk together with someone in their suffering. Now, as you listen, you might be saying, my grief is different. My grief is deeper. And, and I would have no defense for that. No one really knows the suffering of others. No one really knows the pain or how that pain is experienced. Or even how that pain has been compounded by other struggles, other difficulties, other pains, other losses. I mean, some people... Their major struggle right now is, is trying to advance in their careers but falling short. Some people have suffered the pain of loss and others are dealing with chronic, painful, sickening illnesses. Still others suffer within themselves with insecurities and self-doubt. And each Grief, each struggle is difficult, and no one knows exactly how you feel. But, as Stephen Colbert points out, when you suffer, you suddenly can become aware that everyone else is suffering too. This is part of what it means to live. This is part of what it means to be human. And while we can't know the pain of others, the gift of our own pain is the acknowledgement that others do feel pain. In another part of this interview, Anderson Cooper says that his mother would never ask, why me? But instead would ask, why not me? Why would I be immune to the pain that everyone else feels? Of course I'm going to feel pain. Of course I'm going to suffer. And in this way, our own pain can open us to empathy this feeling for other people. Now, pain as a gift is borne out throughout Scripture. And our reading this morning comes out of the Apostle Peter's first letter. And it's addressed generally to the people of Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. Um, and it's appropriate to focus on this text today because the Christians of Asia Minor are experiencing suffering. Uh, it's, it's first century Rome, and, and the culture surrounding these Christians strongly suggests that they should embrace the Roman emperor as Lord. 
And they should be worshiping pagan gods because this is what it meant to be a Roman citizen. This is what it meant to be a citizen of the world. And so because of this, because Christians didn't do these things, they faced pressure from their community. And they were viewed at best as strange outcasts. And at the very worst, they were accused of insurrection. I mean, you contrast that with our society today, which at the very least is much more amenable to the Christian religion. At the very least, we have the ability to insulate ourselves with others who are like-minded so that persecution feels much less. And very few of us face any real struggle on that particular front. But there was a certain level of societal pressure that Christians in first century Rome felt and they were often ostracized for their quirky beliefs by their neighbors. And as the first century wore on, this ostracization and societal pressure turned into charges being brought against Christians so that they would face jail time or physical punishments. Before long, word began spreading of Christians, even some of the apostles, being put to death on the basis of their insurrection. So, this was the audience that, that Peter was addressing, not just the folks facing social pressure or jail time or death, but the people who were also left to pick up the pieces, wondering if following the way of Christ was worth it or if it was only going to bring more pain. Peter begins his letter by outlining what's to come. And he begins by talking about hope. This is what's written in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And I will be reading out of the New Revised Standard Version. Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you rejoice. Even if now, for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, the first thing that I wanna say about this passage is that Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. There is new life happening here, and certainly, as, as we're here on the second Sunday in Easter, we rejoice in that resurrection. But you don't get to that resurrection without suffering. And that suffering is squarely a human trait. Consider then that, that it's such a human trait that God, the light of the world, became human just in order to suffer. That we have a suffering Christ can give each one of us hope in the midst of our own suffering. That it was so important for Jesus to suffer as a means of understanding pain and loss. That it was so important for Jesus Christ to suffer can show us what our suffering can mean and bring to our lives and to the lives of the people around us. Importantly though, for us as followers of Christ. When we suffer, we also have this hope of the resurrection. And when we talk about resurrection, the first thought is of, of Jesus' resurrection. But, but Jesus' resurrection 
was a signal to all of us that pain and suffering, even the pain of death, is not as strong as we like to make it. This resurrection doesn't just belong to Jesus either. Because when we speak of resurrection, we aren't merely talking about a one-time event that happened 2,000 years ago. And to be clear, we're also not talking about just our own resurrection. The signal that Jesus sent on Easter Sunday was that God is making all things, all things new. But here we are. Now, and, and, and while God is making all things new, not all things are yet new. And we still feel the struggle. We still feel the pain. And that pain is still very much linked to our, to our very humanness. Pain is an inevitable part of being alive. So if following Christ doesn't take away all of our pain, what's the point in following Jesus in the first place? Again, Peter talks about the hope of the resurrection. And while pain is inevitable, our hope, our belief, our foundation is that pain is not eternal. Instead, in verses 4 and 5, Peter talks about this gift, this inheritance from God of things that are, are not perishable, things that are not defiled, things that are not going to fade away. And this kind of echoes, it reminds me of what Paul talked about to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And we follow the way of Christ because when we follow the way of faith and hope and love, we know that everything else that brings us pain will eventually fade away. And as those things fade away, the pain we have felt can actually deepen our faith, brighten our hope, grow our love. This is the gift of pain, that if we endure through it, we can become more grateful toward the people in our lives and toward the God who gives us the strength to endure. In verse 7, Peter talks about the genuineness of our faith being tested by fire. And there are stories upon stories of people being resilient in the face of obstacles. And I'm reminded of the movie, um, there, there's a movie about a stockbroker named Chris Gardner. And uh, this movie is called The Pursuit of Happiness. It came out in 2006. And, and this is all about pain and suffering and endurance. Gardner endures homelessness, raising his son on his own, and just trying to survive to the next day so that he can make a better path forward for him and his son. And having been tested by fire, he comes through the other side. He makes partner at a, at a brokerage. Gardner has this immense gratitude for that pain, it's what caused him to write the story of his life in the first place. And he has immense gratitude for the support he received in the midst of it. And because he'd been tested by fire and grew in his strength and his endurance, he began to understand that other people are currently walking that same path, just trying to survive today, to make it to the next day to build a better path forward. And so it causes Gardner, uh, if you read a little bit more about him, he, he regularly supports the CARE program at Glide Memorial United Methodist Church in San Francisco because this is the place that fed into him. This is the place that gave to him. He received shelter in his darkest time. People walked alongside him and so now he's in a position where he can walk alongside others in their suffering. So we often look at life as a journey and, and we understand that pain is, is part of that journey. And other people are walking along as well. And so as we walk this path and as we experience 
this pain, I want to suggest a walking stick, a way to, to mitigate the inevitable pain of the journey. Right now, we're in the midst of the strangest time in my life, and I, I don't know about you, this is just bar none the, the strangest time uh, in my life. And, and, and as a church worker, you know, we're all scrambling, uh, much like people in, in all kinds of other uh, walks of life, all kinds of other careers, we're just scrambling to figure out how to maintain the life of the church in the midst of the coronavirus and, and of stay-at-home orders. And about two weeks ago, I was, I was on a conference call, a Q&A session uh, with, with a pastor by the name of Todd Bolsinger. He's also a, a seminary professor and an author uh, at Fuller Theological Seminary. And, and someone in the crowd, a uh, Reverend Dr. J.A. Briggs, asked these three questions that stuck with me. He asks, what has coronavirus taken away? What has coronavirus not taken away? And what has coronavirus given? Now, I don't, I don't wanna get into the answers to those questions because I think, uh, first of all, each one of us are gonna answer those questions differently. And not only that, but I think even over the last couple of weeks, those answers for me have changed and they're likely to continue changing. But I think that any time we're faced with pain or struggle along the journey, if we're willing to take a moment to ask ourselves these questions, they can remind us of the hope we still have in the resurrection of Christ and remind us of the path that lies ahead of us and the opportunities that lie ahead of us even with and because of our pain. What has this pain actually taken away from me? What has this difficulty not taken away from me? What has this struggle given me? And it's not about weighing whether or not you've come out ahead in the midst of your pain or, or determining whether the suffering is worth it at the moment. Instead, it really is an examination of the opportunities that lie before you to use your pain as a catalyst for mercy toward others. When you suffer, you gain the capacity and depth of mercy for others and become better equipped to walk alongside others in their suffering. In this way, we bring healing and reconciliation into the world and it begins to look a lot more like the imperishable, undefiled, unfading new world of God's vision. Talking about grief isn't much fun and, and and certainly outside of the immediacy of our pain, we don't often want to discuss it. No one wants to be viewed as a whiner or a complainer. No one wants to hold on to their grief for longer than they need to, and no one wants to be seen as throwing themselves a pity party. But, but today's sermon has less to do with my own journey with grief and more to do with the sheer fact that pain will come again. Pain might even come soon and that pain might look like a lost job or a disappointment in a relationship. It might come in the form of fear for the well-being of a loved one or the realization of an addiction. Or that pain might be found in our neighbor, our brother, our sister, even our enemy, who's dealing with suffering in a way that we didn't expect. With every pain comes an opportunity to grow in our faith, to grow in our hope, and grow in our love for God and for one another. Elsewhere in that interview with Stephen Colbert and Anderson Cooper, Cooper opines that he sometimes wishes people would keep asking about how he's doing with regards to his mom's passing. It's uncomfortable to be vulnerable with people, but it's not like he's not already thinking about it. To be sure, there's fear 
of, of saying the wrong thing to someone in the midst of their grief. But someone told me recently that people won't always remember what you said. They will remember that you were there. We, we will never perfectly understand the pain of others, but we can walk alongside them and share in that pain. Oftentimes, without saying a word, but people will remember that you were there. And so, in, in the midst of this very strange, very concerning time, and in the midst of all seasons of pain, loss, grief, and difficulty of every sort, I have three challenges for you. First, when you experience pain or setback, please don't walk alone. If you're pained, if you're struggling, reach out. Don't walk alone in your grief. The second challenge is when you experience pain or setback, pick up that walking stick. Ask those walking stick questions. What has this taken away from me? What has this not taken away? And what has this given to me? And I want to challenge you to ask those questions often and repeatedly because your answer might change. And you might begin by looking back at prior instances of pain and suffering and ask those questions about that. But finally, my last challenge is to always look for those who are suffering around you and be bold in sharing in that suffering as Christ shared in our suffering. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. You loved us so much that you took on the task of understanding our pain, understanding our suffering. And as the Apostle Paul tells us, you work all things for the good of those who love you. But God, some of those times, some of those things that you're working for our good, they don't feel very good. God, help us to regularly seek you. Help us to regularly seek the path of faith and hope and love. Help us to remind ourselves of the hope we have in your resurrection that, that what is today isn't forever. Our limitations today will fade, but faith and hope and love, new life begins in you. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son for our sake not only that you would understand our suffering more, but that at the same time, we would have a path into new life, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. We look forward to the glory of the fullness of a resurrected world. And we carry that hope with us right now to the world because we know we don't have to wait. We can begin right now building that glorious, undefiled, imperishable, love-filled world that you have envisioned. Build it first in our hearts, God, and let that pour out through us. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way. was
This morning, may you know that Christ suffers with you. May the hope of the resurrection of Christ and new life in Christ sustain you. And may the love of Christ pour through you for the sake of others. Amen and amen. <laughs>